Thank you, Lisa. All right. Uh, I'll let that baby go to the lover. Okay, isn't it exciting to be part of a club, an exclusive club, by the way, of people who gave ourselves homework for the rest of our lives? <laughs> You're laughing. It's not a joke, it's terrible. So, a little bit about me. Uh, Gina, already revealed a couple of, Gina already revealed a couple of facts that were all true. Uh, I didn't have a reveal the thing that I grew up in a cult commune thing, and I escaped when I was 17. So, this wasn't great. It was a split off of Scientology. I'm not here to tell that story. But I am here to tell you about how stories saved me real quick. So this was not a good situation. It was plenty of abuse and neglect and uh, hopelessness and no family relationships. For a little while, I lived in Dallas and with about 20 other kids. And the local public library was the Oak Lawn Grant, the Dallas Public Library System. Anybody been there? Oh, I was like, all right, good on you. So I, between the ages of 12 and 16, read every fantasy and science fiction novel in that library. Some of the, the, fantasy, the fantasy ones twice. And then I read a bunch of espionage, and at the ripe old age of 12 or 13, I read Stephen King's It. <laughs> they have not been the same since. Uh, in a good way, and mostly a good way. Yeah, uh, great, great stuff. And, and the comic books were also a huge part of, of that part of my life. And so. Um, it is not exaggeration to say that stories of heroism saved my sanity. I can't say that they saved my life because I don't know if my life was in danger much, sometimes. But they definitely saved my sanity and they saved my own, and, and they set me on a path towards um, a life where I believe that I can be my own hero. Uh, and hero maybe for others if possible. So um, I write books now to try to capture the adventure that carried me away and gave me an escape. Uh, and hopefully give other uh, people the opportunity to be carried away by high adventure. And those are my books. I've got seven books out. Uh, my first book is not an adventure story. It's a novelization of my weird childhood. Uh, it is currently having a nice week on Amazon. It's best ever week, and I'm a little distracted. Which is kind of but, uh, thank you very much. <laughs> it's had me quite distracted the entire week. Okay. So, we've all overcome lots of things. We... We've been doing this for a while, some of us some of us maybe started two days ago. That's okay, we're all in the same group and we're in the right place. This writing thing can be hard, right? It can be hard. I want to thank a couple of people before we move on to my next slide. <clears throat> this stuff is uh, a conglomerate, essentially, of a lot of stuff I've been studying and reading in my day job, in my uh, non-day job, and other stuff that I do. So, thanks to these guys, they're awesome. I recommend Stephen Pressman's book, the War of Art. It is fantastic. So we'll talk about some of the stuff there, and I don't know that I'll refer out to them, but thank you guys, you're rad. Okay, so, incognito conversations. I have a couple of quick, quick questions for you. Um, is writing the easiest thing you ever tried to do? Okay, raise your hand if writing is the easiest thing you ever tried to do. We're in a good place, very good. Uh, is breathing easy? Raise your hand if breathing's easy. If it's okay, if it's not, I understand. I totally do. Very good. So, how about opening your eyes? Is that fairly easy? Yeah. All. Oh. Understood. Understood. We think that writing should come naturally, right? We, we think that it should, like that wonderful video Gina just showed, because we speak English or we speak whatever language we speak. Writing does not come naturally, it's an extremely unnatural experience. So let me just start off with that important point. We're trying to get our brain to do something different. And yet sometimes we let our brain do whatever it wants. But we're the boss of our brain. Did you know that your happy little brain is always on? It's always doing stuff. It's always in contact with the world and bringing in all the stimuli. And we're always in contact with it, although we don't always realize that. So if I start speaking nonsense, I'm in contact with my brain, but something has gone wrong, right? So I call kind of the unconscious contact incognito conversations. We are responding to what our brain's telling us to do, and I want to do a couple of quick experiments to try to demonstrate that. No, they're not really experiments. I'm hoping that, I think, I think I know how this will go. If not, that's okay, we'll keep going. Anybody want to just voluntarily, without looking, tell me one thing that's in your bag? Don't look. Go ahead. 
a toothbrush is in your bag. Right now, what color is that toothbrush? White. All right. Thank you. What else? Anybody else? What's in your bag? Don't reveal anything crazy, though, but in the bag. A cashmere scarf. What color is it? Blue. How does it feel? Very soft. Okay. You're, but you're not wearing it right now. Interesting. What's in your bag? My laptop. Your laptop. And do you know how to turn that laptop on? You've done it a lot, right? Yeah. Very nice. Okay, so that's one. That went well. Good. Let's see how these next go. How about an interesting factoid? Just take time, 10 seconds or 15 seconds and somebody volunteer an interesting factoid about literally anything, something cool that you know. 